the ideas don't really I feel like they don't come from me because when they land in my mind or wherever they land I just know what to do and in the case of this film um, the idea it just landed complete it was like exactly <laughs> how it was supposed to look and be and then I was like all right man <laughs> now I need to just trying to 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 live up to this inspiration that that has come to me from somewhere so I'm not trying to I'm not thinking about the viewer when I make the film I'm not trying to do something I'm I have just opened up so that inspiration can come through and then I'm I'm trying my best to to do the inspiration justice and I feel like that's it like I mentioned before with all the privilege that I've had working with talented people and learning about light and learning about cinematography, learning about audio. I'm trying to take that knowledge and to do the inspiration that I get justice and to, to make it into something that is is as good as the, uh, <laughs> the, the inspiration that I feel inside of me. Welcome to Edge Talkers. I'm your host, Todd Lennox. Taoist, Buddhist, Muslim, Jew. Christian, Hindu, chosen few. Temple burning, atheism. Those are just a few of the topics we will be discussing and the people we will be hearing from on Edge Talkers. Dogs and rats, child bearing, those without, single, married, gangs and scouts. Thank you to Matt Venuti for graciously letting us use his song, The Rhythm of Life, for our intro and outro. You can download this song and check out the rest of his songs and albums at mattvenuti.com. That's M-A-T-T-V-E-N-U-T-I. And indeed, in this rhythm of life, we are all in this together. We're all in this, the rhythm of life. Rhythm of life. Welcome to another episode of Edge Talkers. I'm your host, Todd Lennox. And today we're having a conversation with Matthias Olsen, a filmmaker from Sweden. And Matthias, I found out about you because I'm a follower of Charles Eisenstein and in a few Facebook groups revolving around his work. And I just completed a course called Living in the Gift. And through all of those things, your videos started popping up on my Facebook feed. And I just found them very alluring. And especially when it came to Charles' work, you know, because you you know, there's a lot of interviews with him online and he's got a podcast, but you, you presented him in a way that uh, really brought a kind of added layer of depth and nature and the earth. And so I started following you and <laughs> just love your work. And so maybe you could just start by giving an introduction. How did you become a filmmaker? A little bit about your background and that people know about you. It's always hard to know where to begin. In a way, I'd like to begin when I'm 10 years old. I'll begin even earlier than that. My, I'll begin with my dad. He used to work as a teacher. And when he had worked as a teacher for 25 years, there's a custom here in Sweden that, um, I don't know if that's in other parts of the world too, but you, you're given a golden watch when you've worked someplace for 25 years. But he didn't really care. He didn't want, he didn't need a golden watch. So he went to the principal or whoever it was and said, can I, could I get something of equal value? That's something else. And they were like, I don't know that we never had that request before. But, uh, but he ended up getting a camera instead of the golden watch. And that camera, it was a Canon AE-1. And when I was 10, maybe 11 or 12, uh, I was really into photography and I had a crappy camera and my dad gave me his camera that he had received for working 25 years as a teacher and um, it was beautiful and it was my companion throughout high school. It made it easier to go up to girls because I could say, oh, could I take a, a photograph of you maybe? 
and it was a nice way to because uh, I was a little bit shy but with the camera I was a little bit more brave so I could speak to girls which was great and yeah it was just a, a cool thing and I did the whole dark room um, Tri-X D76 um, I don't know if these things mean anything to you but maybe to some people that have that know that smell of the dark room and the, and the fixer and the, that became an obsession for me um, taking black and white photographs printing them at school and then later I got a, a small really crummy but somewhat working darkroom in the house where I grew up and uh, yeah I could make prints of whoever I photographed and, and give it to them and that was the way way back introduction to how I became a filmmaker. <laughs> when did you transition from still photographs to film? That was about it began around 2004, 2005. Um, I had moved to New York when I was 21. I was working as a photo assistant in New York. And then I went on my own as a photographer in 1999 um, and worked as a photographer. And surprisingly, to myself at least, did pretty well. I had good clients and uh, I even shot a few couple of things for Vanity Fair and uh, like I was doing pretty well. But the main type of client that I had was uh, of the uh, fitness, um, self, uh, feeling good type magazine. So like a, a, a typical thing that I would shoot would be a, a model on a beach. Like maybe let's say she was had freckles and looked you know, just um, just happy from the bottom of her soul. And maybe she was jumping and the waves splashing behind her. And then next to that photograph in the magazine would be something saying something like, oh, if you use this skin lotion, you'll be just as happy as this person or something like that. So in the, in the beginning of that, I was just uh, really allured by, I mean, the travel and the, the, the circumstance of it. Um, you know, I got to travel to, I, you know, I'm a, somebody from a small place in Sweden. I, I moved to New York and suddenly I was flying to L.A. and to Miami and doing all these things and even to the Caribbean and um, eating at fancy restaurants, staying at nice hotels. It was it was great. But as it progressed, there was this little voice inside of me saying, like, what is this? What are you do what are you doing, basically? Uh, what's the end product here? What's like, is this? Is this what you're going to do with your life? And then I didn't really want to be part of that world anymore. So I started transitioning into portrait photography. Um, and that's when I was doing some work for, for Vanity Fair, like I mentioned. And that was cool. But there was a, this film festival that happened annually in New York, uh, organized by the Human Rights Watch. And so I started going to that film festival every year. And it would be like the directors of these amazing films would be there and you could, there were Q and A's and this was a new universe to me. I would be the person in the front row, like asking questions. And I was totally, totally amazed. I'm super grateful to Human Rights Watch and to that film festival and to all those filmmakers that came there. And I, at, at one point I, I went there like every year for five years or something. And at one point I was like, this is what I want to be doing. Like, nothing else this is exactly what i need to be doing you mentioned you were in new york in 99 were you also in new york in 2001 yeah uh, i was so yeah i was actually a, a witness to the 9 11 attacks um i had just come from sweden uh, two days prior um i'd been home for the summer break and so I was up early, which I'm usually not up that early, but I was up early because of the jet lag and the time difference. And I was making breakfast and watching CNN. Um, or CNN was on in the background anyways. And suddenly they said something like, the, something has happened at the World Trade Center. We don't know exactly what's going on, but it seems like a, a Cessna plane or some small aircraft has hit the, one of the towers. Like there was confusion about it. And I lived in Brooklyn and it was kind of far away. Um, but still, it was from my roof, you could see the Twin Towers very easily and very well. So I just went up onto my roof and a few other people from my building came up onto the roof and we were speculating and looking and we we're like, yeah, that doesn't look like a Cessna or a small sports plane, that, that looks pretty severe. 
And as we're standing there, the second plane comes in and, and rams the second tower. And at that point, I was convinced that New York was under a full-scale attack. I, I looked at the UN building, at Empire State Building, at the Chrysler Building. I was, I was sure that like, there were another 10 planes coming. And what kind of feelings? Uh, you mentioned what you thought you were under full-scale attack, as I think many people did, whether there or watching on television. I mean, I remember I felt like, okay, this is it. We're, you know, the chickens have come home to roost. We are under attack, and who knows by whom and by how many. But as a Swedish-born expat working in the U.S., what, as you looked around at maybe some citizens of the U.S. and the people and saw the plane, you know, what were you thinking? What were you feeling? It, it was a real mixed Bag. I mean, I really felt like a New Yorker. I, I didn't feel like anything other than a, a New Yorker. Uh, United States and New York is made up of people from all kinds of places. And so I felt like my, my town had been attacked. But I, I really was looking for answers. Like who, because I had been completely uninterested in politics or foreign affairs. Like, remember, I was the one like on the beach photographing models, jumping, you know. I, I wasn't, I'm not going to say I wasn't a deep person. I, I, there was depth to me as well. But I was not interested in or didn't know anything about um, foreign affairs or what was going on in the United States or like Vietnam or any World War II. Like I, I didn't really care. But I, when that happened, I realized that there, there, there must be some, like a really deep set of answers here or, or beginning of set of answers and when i listened to the radio and and watched television and watched the the letterman show or whatever it was or cnn i couldn't get any satisfying answers the answers were all very flat um shallow and saying things like yeah they attacked us because they hate our freedom i was like that's i mean are you expecting me to buy that i mean i was used to buying politicians bullshit because i didn't really care but when this happened, I was like, look, I really care now. I really want a, a truthful answer. And we were all in shock. I feel like I was part of a nation that was in shock. But the answers were just silly. So I, was, so I started doing a little bit of research on my own and started reading up a little bit on history and started looking at news differently and just asked myself, like, what could have happened to a person or a, a group of individuals to make them do this thing? I just didn't buy the whole... They're evil doers or whatever. You remember George Bush was like, yeah, they're evil doers. We're going to smoke out those evil doers. It was just so full of, you're either with us or against us, with them. I can't remember all the silly things he was saying, but it, it just didn't, it, it just hit me the wrong way and, and made me question all sorts of things and brought up all kinds of other things that I had been questioning, but not actively questioning. Yeah, I had similar reaction myself, you know, and hearing the evildoers and all that. If you had any complexity or depth to thinking, you just start to realize how shallow the information is that we're presented with. And, you know, just makes you want to dig deeper and deeper. And so, you know, with your story, I mean, you started, it's like this synchronistic weave of events that happened in your life to sort of bring you where you are today. You had the you know, your dad refusing the gold watch. <laughs> what a great metaphor, you know, just uh, got the camera and gave the camera to his son. And that, that just opened up a whole world for you, both visually and helping you with a, a fear you might have had to interact with people. You know, you had this kind of tool to use to connect with people. And then with the Human Rights Watch bringing you even deeper and you found a sort of purpose in your trade. And then with 9-11, down the rabbit hole you go. Yeah. You have a kind of tagline that says documentaries to fuel the transition into a more beautiful world. Yeah. Which uh, I think is just a beautiful encapsulation of purpose. Maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit about your current work and documentaries and, you know, what, just what are you trying to do? I'm trying to, I feel like, I've had, a, still have a very privileged life. Um, I I've, I've was born in a country where education is free and 
I was able to go to uh, photography college um, and I had an idea to go to New York and work as a photo assistant and I did. That's not something that anybody can do. Um, and when I was in New York, I was uh, fortunate enough to work with some amazing people. I was um, assisting a photographer named Arthur Elgort, who is like one of the top fashion photographers uh, of his time uh, or of his uh, era. And then when I wanted to transition into filmmaking, I applied for film school in Sweden, moved back to Sweden. I just feel like every door that I've knocked on has opened and it's been super privilege. And so w what does one do with that? Like either you kind of feel bad that you're privileged and then but still continue being privileged or you try to take that privilege and and do the best that you can to give something back and and I haven't really known before what to give back uh, I haven't really known what I wanted to say I have felt that things are wrong in our world and the the 9-11 attacks opened up a whole new set of questions that took me like you said down the rabbit hole but it wasn't until about six years ago maybe that it all started really coming together and that's when I read a book by Charles we mentioned Charles Eisenstein before um it was a colleague of mine who had his book, The Ascent of Humanity, laying on his desk. And I thought, I picked it up, I thought it was a book on human civilization and the great uh, things that we have done, <laughs> you know, since the last 10,000 years. But it wasn't at all. I was just intrigued. I started reading and I asked my colleague, like, what is this book? And he just laughed and he said, yeah, you, you <laughs> it's, it's heavy stuff, man. And I was like, can I borrow it? He's like, yeah, sure, just bring it back. And I started reading it, and I should say that at the same or within the same time period, I also read another book that meant a lot to me, which was called Ishmael by an author who actually sadly recently passed away. Uh, his name is Daniel Quinn. But Ishmael is a wonderful book. But man, the, the cocktail of reading Ishmael and The Ascent of Humanity was just, and with all the stuff that had been building up in me, that was just like, whoa. And really, really started a, a, a huge change in my life. And like one illustration of that change is that somewhere in the middle of um, The Ascent of Humanity, I was reading it in my bed, in bedroom and my, uh, my wife was uh, laying next to me. And at some point, I don't know exactly what chapter it was now, but I just closed the book and I was like, man, we, gotta, we, we have to leave the city. Well, I was, we were living in Stockholm, uh, so like concrete jungle kind of thing. Um, and I was like, man, we we need to go to the countryside. We need to get more in contact with soil, and with, with we need to be someplace where we can see the stars at night. And she was like, yeah, it just totally. We had never really talked about it. Uh, we both knew that we didn't want to live where we lived forever, but we had never, we didn't have any plans really. And but at that point, it was like, yeah, let's do it. And yeah, an hour later, she was uh, online looking for plots of land to buy and. And I think one year, almost exactly to the date, one year after I said, we got to leave this place, we um, we moved to the country and we built a, a house. And I'm now like uh, growing, tr trying to learn to, to grow um, our own produce. And it's, that was a, a powerful cocktail. So yeah, and, and obviously that affected also my my um, uh, profession, which at the time I was working with documentary films, um, but more like the, the regular sort of uh, business or like of making films and, and competing to have them shown in prestigious festivals and stuff like this. I was very much in it, not very much, but I was in it to to be applauded and, you know, to have my thing shown on, on in Cannes or in some um, some festival that really was important. But that book started a transition where I realized that I, it's not about me. It's, it's about trying to give something back. And now I know what to do. Now I know in which direction I want to go. And if I can spread inspiration for that direction to other people, then that's what I want to do. That's a beautiful story. And I, you have a film. Uh, let's just mention your website. It's www.campfire.com 
hyphenstories.org. You just go there. You can see all your films that you have made. And there's one called An Unlearning, which is just, I mean, I, I, I'm going to let you tell the story, but I just, I was sort of blown away with all the synchronistic events that happened to make that film. Can you tell that story? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so like I said, the, the book by Charles Eisenstein turned my life around. And a few years later, I hear from a friend that Charles Eisenstein is coming to Sweden to, to take part in some event. And I was like, man, I, I need to meet this person. I need to somehow be part of this. And then I learned, not only is he coming to Sweden, he's coming to Järna, which is this small town outside of, it's about, well, it doesn't matter, it's about an hour outside of Stockholm, but it's this small town, and he's coming to, to, to my town. Yeah. yeah. And then not only is he coming to my hometown, he's coming to be part of an event organized by something called YIP, which stands for the Youth Initiative Program. And that takes place about three kilometers from my house. So not only is he coming to Sweden, he's coming to three kilometers yeah. away from my house. So I was like, okay. And I'm like, what do I do with this information? How do I, you know, begin to reach out to somebody? I didn't know, like, how to get a hold of him. So I just went... You must have felt like there's some sort of cosmic hand at play, like Charles is literally coming to your neighborhood. It's just amazing. Yeah, but at the time, I didn't know whether I was going to be able to meet him or not. So I was like, <laughs> I was too busy trying to make the meeting happen to, to appreciate the, all the synchronicities. I appreciated them after it had happened. <laughs> and as it turned out, I, so I did write to him on his website. There's a contact form and I don't know about you but I you know when you write something in a contact form on somebody's website it just feels like it goes into cyberspace like nobody's ever going to read that or whatever but I was like oh please my name is so and so and Charles work has meant so much to me and would it be possible to meet him and then uh, surprisingly I got a res response two days later um saying that yeah Charles is happy to meet you so we needed a quiet space for the interview and I suggested we go to my house to do the interview there and so the universe delivered Charles Eisenstein to my living room, <laughs> which I thought was pretty good. Yeah, that's not bad. <laughs> could, do, could do a lot worse than that. <laughs> you also released that interview in snippets on Facebook. Is that the same interview that you see little one minute clips of? Yeah, that's the same. I wrote down all these different questions that I wanted to ask and, and I, I asked them all. And it, so it turned out to be like an hour and a half interview. But I knew, I knew I wanted to make a film and you can't really make a film with a one and a half hour interview unless you have a lot of other things going on visually. So I knew I had to pick out some, some portions of the interview for the film. And so I, I knew which parts I wanted to base the film around. And that was about uh, three questions out of the, I don't know, 12 questions that I asked him. And so the rest, I didn't want to go to waste, obviously, because I thought there were really deep responses that he gave and thoughtful responses and so I turned it into um, a, a series um, so each question that I ask is its own clip and you can see that also on my website it's called the Charles Eisenstein series so that's th those are I don't know if it's maybe 10 between three and six minute clips um, so that's the basically the entire interview is there but then I, I took out some portions for the film and the film is more about my own feeling as a child of like man something is off in this world something is not right and then when I found or read that book The Ascent of Humanity and the the way that Charles was able to answer all those or, or speak to all those things that in my life I just felt like sort of lumps in the stomach you know like it's Sunday afternoon and you feel a lump in your stomach because you have to do something on Monday morning that you don't really want to be doing stuff like that and so he's just able to address that in a beautiful way. And so the film is, that's how the film begins. And then it ends up him talking about his new book, which is on climate. And, and I'm weaving it in with the, the YIP, the uh, Youth Initiative Program gathering and, and so forth. Yeah, there's a beautiful interweaving there. And I felt the same way when I first read Charles. The thing that really hit me beyond some really just brilliant thoughts about economy and environment and, you know, ways of looking at some of those things that just aren't really looked at uh, typically by most 
scholars or philosophers or scientists. And one of the things that got me was there's a kind of wrongness that he felt growing up and that that's actually a gift to actually be able to feel that there's, there's something not quite right with what most people call that's just the way that it is. Yeah. And then, you know, he doesn't stop there, of course. He goes on to also explore what we can actually do. And some of that involves things like what you did, which I can understand from reading his book. You said, let's go to the country. <laughs> let's get back into nature. Yeah. Beyond social movements or social justice issues and political action, I think the core of his message right now and the message that I subscribe to is we really have to fall in love with the earth again. Yeah. There's no reason to fight these big battles if we're just going to end up having another revolution where the bottom becomes the top and the top becomes the bottom and, you know, the whole ugly process just keeps repeating itself. We really have to get connected to the earth and to each other. Yeah. Sometimes when people ask me if I can sum up what I'm doing in, in, in a sentence, I've come up with this one sentence that sort of works, or it's two sentences, and it goes something like this. The underlying story that all of the... This is going to be actually more than two sentences. <laughs> but the underlying story that, that all of the institutions, or 95, 99% of the institutions of the world are built upon, says that the earth belongs to humans to explore or to do whatever we want with it. But if we just turn that sentence around and say humans belong to the earth, it's a huge shift, but you just need to reorganize the words. So it's the same sentence, you just reorganize it. And if we can do that, of course, that's easier said than done. But um, I think that, for me, that works as a great metaphor. We're all in this together. You have... Um New film, your latest film, I think, called Morphic Resonance. Yep. I thought it was one of the most powerful films I've seen. And am I right in saying there's there's singing, but there's no spoken dialogue? Is that right? Yeah, there are no. That was one of the rules for the film. There are to be no words of any human language, but yeah, a lot of other utterances. But it certainly evokes, and me anyway, it evoked a lot of thinking. Uh, but but be, below that or beneath that, there's a feeling that starts to resonate. And I'm wondering how conscious you are of your viewers in watching the film. Are you trying to evoke a certain feeling or are you just trying to express a feeling that you have and then however it lands, it lands? Yeah, that would be the way I used to work. Uh, meaning you have an idea or you come up with an idea and then you try to follow through on that idea that you've come up with. Um, that would be the brain working. The, the new way <laughs> that I make films um, is a little bit less... Like, I don't know what's going on sometimes. But basically, I have figured out a way to open the little door inside of me that goes to someplace else. And I think we could label it inspiration. The ideas don't really, I feel like they don't come from me because when they land in my mind or wherever they land, I just know what to do. And in the case of this film, um, the idea, it just landed complete. It was like exactly <laughs> how it was supposed to look and be. And then I was like, all right, man, <laughs> now I need to just trying to, to, to live up to this inspiration that that has come to me from somewhere. So I'm not trying to... I'm not thinking about the viewer when I make the film. I'm not trying to do something. I'm, I have just opened up so that inspiration can come through. And then I'm, I'm trying my best to, to do the inspiration justice. And I feel like that's, it, like I mentioned before, with all the privilege that I've had working with talented people and learning about light and learning about cinematography, learning about audio. I'm trying to take that knowledge and to do the inspiration that I get justice and to, to make it into something that is, is as good as the, uh, <laughs> the, the inspiration that I feel inside of me. Morphic resonance was a term coined by Rupert Sheldrake. And, uh, you know, he's most notoriously known for being one of the handful of people that got kicked off the TED stage 
and <laughs> yank, yanked from the Ted pantheon of videos. And I don't understand that at all. But, you know, he says things that obviously aren't really accepted in the mainstream of scientific and philosophical and educational. You would, you would think you'd want education to be about listening to all sides and all points of view, but I guess not. Anyway, morphic resonance shows up in your film as the title, obviously, but there's a, first of all, there's a communication between each person that you focus on in the film and the nature that they're in. There's that resonance, but I just found it really compelling. And I, I don't want to really give away the film. I want people to watch it and discover this for themselves. But there's a sort of blending, which is obviously intentional. I mean, you, you had to cut it this way. Did you start the film knowing all the people you're going to be filming and, and having an idea that by the end of the film, you wanted to kind of piece it together the way that you did? Or did that come in the middle of you doing all of this? I definitely knew uh, from the first day of shooting that it was going to be like the final chapter would be everybody together. Uh, look, now I gave it away instead of you, but that's fine. <laughs> um, so I, I knew that and that's how I structured it. And and I, I filmed the different chapters in an order that would make sense so that the second person could listen to what the first person had done and uh, and add to that, so to speak. There are five uh, characters in the film. Uh, I knew the, the four, four of them, uh, I knew right like from the beginning, like exactly these four and how it was going to play out, basically. The fifth one was a surprise. Um, the fifth one that was added is the woman on the, the frozen lake who plays the crystal bowls uh, and goes for a crazy skinny dipping, uh, frozen skinny dipping thing towards the end. Yeah, that was a surprise. She came, my, my wife runs a yoga studio and she sometimes has um, crystal bowl meditation sessions there. Uh, and I attended one of those and she approached me afterwards and, and because she knew I was a filmmaker and asked if I could film her somehow when she was playing the crystal bowls. And I was like, nah, you know, I'm, I'm very busy. There's so many pro film projects going on. I don't really have the time. I'm sorry, but maybe, maybe we'll make the time somehow. But... And then we just started talking and um, long story short, towards the end of the conversation, I was like, man, I, I need to <laughs> film this, this woman. And, um, and then it hit me, maybe she can be part of this film. So that was, that was an addition that I didn't foresee in my uh, <laughs> divine inspiratory uh, leading up to starting the, shooting the film. And um, the other chapters I had filmed uh, in the summer and, and in the fall and so we decided let's wait until it's winter time because that just seemed to make sense with crystal bowls that it would be icy and snowy and i knew that would make a nice contrast to the other sequences i live in an area where there's a lot of lakes so when the lakes are frozen over and we have a, a spare couple of hours let's uh, let's make a date on the middle of the ice and and i'll bring the my gear and we'll see what comes of it and uh, and that's what we did. And I thought that, I mean, it's hard to, you can't really say that one chapter is better than another, but I thought her contribution really made the other chapters better. And it just like, yeah, it made the film take off to another dimension. I'm curious, did she do any kind of preparation before she dipped in the ice water there? She's uh, one of those fortunate ones that, that don't need that, doesn't need that. Um, uh, she just told me that yeah she just does not have an issue with cold the cold and uh, but we didn't we hadn't planned on the ice bathing to be part of the thing it just uh, because she was at one point you'll see um now i'm giving more away from the film but hey at one point you'll see that she's uh, like poking or stabbing the ice with a, a big branch yeah i thought there was some kind of musical thing she was doing I, yeah, th th like that was I was preparing the, my gear and she walked away and started doing that. And I just turned the camera and switched it on. So it just yeah. sounded like something that I needed to capture. And then we did the thing. She played the, the crystal balls and everything. And then at the end, I, I was asked, so I filmed you before, like, what were you doing? What's the thing? And she's like, yeah, that's my uh, my bathing hole. So, yeah, that's that's my spot for for taking winter baths. And it had frozen over. And I usually bring a, an axe to 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 open it up and it was the ice was so thick it, I had a hard time opening it up 
And uh, yeah, I might actually, uh, I opened it up, so I might actually take uh, a bath now, if you don't mind. And I was like, well, it, if you don't mind that I film it. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, yeah you can film it. Um, just let me see it before you release anything, just to, yeah, so it doesn't, it's not too much nudity. <laughs> And so, yeah, she let me film it, and then uh, she, uh, I invited her into the editing room and um, just to make sure that she was happy with showing her butt on my film. And she said, yeah, that's, that's cool. So that was just another little surprise that I, th that I didn't know was going to happen. And that's the thing. When, if, you think, if you come up with an idea like this is how the film is going to be, and you make a, um, what's that called, that you make a, 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 like where you write the scenes, like scene A... Shot list. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, yeah, shot A and then angle B and you do the whole thing. Then, you, like, w there's no room for shit like that to happen. So, I don't know. I just go into it with a different mindset. And and also, there's no pressure because before I would work, I, I still do sometimes, but I, I would work more for the, like, Swedish national television and stuff like that. And there's a certain amount of pressure that things have to be a certain way. But now that I'm doing films for Campfire Stories... Uh, nobody can tell me this is not good enough or whatever and that just makes me breathe easier and I can just do things that yeah there's there's no pressure and that allows for things that wouldn't otherwise have happened or that I wouldn't otherwise have captured to to take place and be captured and be part of the project. Well I love that thought of staying open and it's just such a beautiful scene there I mean you kind of like what am thinking what am I looking at but while you're while you're thinking that you're just feeling I was feeling just so moved and it did feel too like oh I'm observing something spontaneous and real here this is it doesn't feel planned I mean almost like how could it be planned what would you do say okay now you're gonna like open a hole in the water and you know and and go in that just doesn't make sense but it but then you watch it it does make sense and if if it had come from me I think it would be a different thing like me as a male filmmaker and and the female subject and i would be like oh would you mind like taking off your clothes i mean it's it just wouldn't like even if i wouldn't present it that way it made sense the way it happened because it came from her and and, and i was brave enough to say hey, do you mind if i film it and she was brave enough to say yes and and yeah well talking about how you're free now to create a film or have a film create through you for working for someone or having to fit into a prescribed script, you have also a different sort of model for making money. You sell tickets, but it's uh, basically a donation-based system. And this kind of also goes along with one of Charles's ideas about sacred economy or gift economy. I'm wondering if you could talk about that. And also, you know, I just did this living in the gift course. And one of the topics of discussion, it's all great to have a gift economy idea or a sacred economy vision but this is the real world we have to pay rent or mortgage or buy food is that working for you how is it working maybe some struggles you've had and give people some idea of how you go about working with the economics of filmmaking um yeah it, it's not really working yet um i so i work with campfire stories like uh, full time and but the the income that i make through people's donations are probably about maybe 30% of what I would need to be able to sustain myself. So it's it's not really working. However, I relatively recently started this project. So any endeavor or any um, organization that starts up, probably, I mean, if you go to business school and listen to the, the what they say there, it probably takes four or five years to, to break even, right? Um, so I think it's the same with me. Um, I think I'm... I mean, I'm on the path of getting to the point of break even. And in the meantime, I'm, um, I'm, yeah, we're renting out a cottage and we're like doing some, just keeping our expenses really low. And uh, my wife is helping out, and so we're making it work. But I, I think it's it's heading in that direction. I didn't want to say this is how much a film is worth because how can I, if I, if I say it's worth five dollars. Like I make a film and it's worth five dollars. First off, from my perspective, I would be putting a, a finite price on something that is just 
to me it's like so much work and so much passion and just so much of my creativity in my life how can i say that's worth five dollars that's infinitely too low i mean it's worth millions of dollars you know each ticket but at the same time for somebody who maybe doesn't have five dollars it's infinitely too much and i don't know about people's economy um i want my films to be able to be viewed by everybody so maybe somebody living in new york for them five dollars is nothing it's a cup of coffee but for somebody living in maybe in india or some other part of the world maybe five dollars or even somebody living in new york who's just been laid off or, or there's plenty of reasons why five dollars could be too much to ask and i also don't like paywalls when i go to some site and it's like you have to do this in order to like there's nothing free there's no free lunch like i don't i don't like that i like when people are are generous and and the internet is such a impersonal place and it's sort of a grab and run type atmosphere and if i can contribute to it not being that then it just feels much better to to trust the people i mean the people that i want to be followers of this project are the kind of people that I would want to trust with the keys to my home or whatever. Um, so it just makes sense to say, look, if you're in a situation where you don't uh, aren't able to pay for a ticket, or if you don't feel like it because you don't feel like walking to your wallet to get your credit card, fine, you know, watch it anyway. And I, I, I think that if you watch the film and really, really liked it, and you come back and you watch another one and another one, eventually, even if you're lazy and the wallet is way over there, eventually you want to give something because you appreciate the content and you appreciate that this is not something done by some major platform uh, in Hollywood or something. It's This is made by a person. And probably most people will say, I, I want to contribute to this, even if it's $1 or $10. And the funny thing is, I've noticed that, so a lot of people don't pay, which is normal. I, maybe I wouldn't have paid if, like it takes a while to build a, a relationship and to get to know the the. the the films and to to know that you really appreciate it so that's fine that some people are like uh, not paying but what i've noticed is that a lot of people are paying uh 20 for a ticket or 10 dollars, 20 uh 50 some people i had one person pay 100 dollars the other day so so some people are like man i want to support this 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 resonates with me i you know here's 100 dollars. so they're making up for the people that are unable to or unwilling to for some for some reason to pay and I that's a, a different kind of economy that I don't think replaces the regular economy but is a great complement. You have a video called Vaccine a conversation it's a 23 minute short film. Yeah. I'm just going to read the blurb you have on your website about it. What I learned during the making of this film is this. The danger lies not in the risk of being misled into trusting the wrong camp. The risk lies in believing that such a complex matter should have an answer as simple as yes or no. Yeah. Um, and maybe, you know, we don't have to really get into the whole Vax thing. <laughs> <that's a> whole, <laughs> but, but just the, the idea of this polarity where we're presented with yes or no, you know, our options are yes or no. Our options are blue or red, you know, Republican or Democrat, uh, communism or capitalism democracy or socialism. I mean, we're planted with these two ideas and we think, because that's what we see as choice, we think that... Sorry, I, I love how you, it's very American of you, to, yeah. to place um, democracy and socialism as opposites. Yes. Sorry, no. just a little... <laughs> I know. I, well, I <laughs> within, say, within brackets. <laughs> yeah, I say that with full irony. Yes, I understand. Yeah. But those choices are implanted into our brain as what we're supposed to see as freedom of choice. And so, well, okay, I have, I can do vax or anti-vax. That's my option. Okay, well, I choose vax. I want to safely vaccinate my kids. I want to uh, make sure that my community is safe of measles and mumps and diphtheria and polio. You know, this is modern science marching to, towards the progress of disease-free life for all. Or I'm anti-vax. Okay, I, you know, there's poisons in vaccines. There's some people that actually react to vaccines in ways that are more dangerous than the disease they're trying to prevent. So I'm an anti-vax. Mm -hmm. And just taking away all the gray areas and shades of health 
that are available to us as human beings and natural ways of not becoming disease laden. I mean, I can go on and on about it being beyond vax or anti-vax. And uh, there's just this issue of polarity in the world. Yeah. And I think a lot of it comes down to getting ratings for media because they thrive on controversy and controversy is most easily generated by having two sides argue against each other. Yeah. And your films, and I think what you tried to say in that film is there's so much more than vax versus anti-vax. And I think your other films, even morphic resonance, there's nothing to argue with. I can't really see a point of view that you're trying to put across on me or, or dupe me into. It's just this beautiful thing that I guess either resonates with you or don't. It resonated with me. So you have in your films a kind of other language besides this polarity-inducing language. And I'm wondering how conscious you are of that. I mean, I think you're super conscious of it in that film, but in all of your films, is that a gap you're trying to bridge or what are your feelings on all this rambling that I'm <laughs> spewing forth? I'm part of this world too of good versus evil. Um, that's, you know, what I was raised with like everybody else, you know, all the movies with uh, the superheroes and the super villains and uh, good forces uh, are to overcome the evil forces and then we live happily ever after. I think that the idea of good and evil probably came about when we went from being hunter-gatherers to being farmers. Um, where when we for the first time started building fences and calling a certain place mine and asking of the ground that it provide food for us and suddenly seeing other creatures that invade on our food as outside uh, as others uh, or wolves that took our uh, uh, chickens or whatever it was um, so I think that's where it probably came from so if you if you really zoom out it's kind of a new idea that there even is such a thing as good and evil um so i think it's it's valuable to try to remember those times that came before uh, that i think we probably carry somewhere inside of us um in our dna that just recognizes that that even i mean it's tricky it seems like you know, if you look at, you know, Hitler or some person like that, it, it seems like there are people in this world who are evil, and maybe there are, I don't know. Um, but I think, I will say this, I think most of the people who we deem to be evil are just probably doing their best from their circumstances. If we really understood their circumstances, if we really understood the way they grew up and which culture they grew up, and if we really listened to them, we m might not agree with them, but we might understand why they're behaving the way they're behaving. But it's tricky. I mean, you, you talk about ISIS or terrorism or talk about all these things. It's easy to just think, and I do too, you know, let's just kill them, get rid of them, you know, you get angry. Um, but I think of, th there's a kind of a mushroom in Sweden, at least. I don't know if, if you have that over there. It's um, when you stomp on it, it there's like a puff of cloud like a cloudy puff of smoke it's kind of uh, you can eat it when it's young but when then when it gets older it, it balloons up and you can stomp on it and yeah a, a puff of cloud comes out from it and it's it's great fun for the kids they they stomp away and it's like yeah it feels like a little explosion when you when you stomp on it and that's how i feel because what you're doing if we just pretend for a moment that that's a terrorist that mushroom and you stomp on it all you want, and you're like, yeah, look at that cloud, look, I killed you, I killed you, man, and there's a cloud, but you look, what is that cloud? It's, it's spores, that, that <laughs> you're helping the cloud to, re what's the word, to, to propagate, to, to, yeah, so that's, I think that's a metaphor that works well for terrorism or, or evildoers, as George W. Bush used to call them, um, and if you think that way, you probably, if you don't want that mushroom to be all over the, the, your woods, you well, the, maybe you have to understand how it grows, what's 
what's its thing? How can we? There's got to be different alternative ways to to deal with ISIS or whatever. You know, that's one of the reasons I love watching your films. It's not there's no point of view, even in the vaxer, the vaccines uh, film. You know, there's, you're really not taking a point of view. I think I think you have a point of view about that, as do I. That vaccines aren't the panacea for everything for everyone and there is some more investigation that needs to happen and if science was really about discovering the truth then science would also be questioning vaccines certain things about it yeah i mean i am i am taking the point of view i'm not really taking a point of view in the debate i don't know anything about the debate i'm i don't have any special knowledge on the topic but i'm taking the point of view that because I give it a little bit of background for the film. I, I When we moved to the country, we moved to this... Uh, I, I didn't know it at the time, but we moved to an area of Sweden that's sort of alternative. I knew it was alternative, but I didn't know about the vaccine. I didn't know that it was an issue at all. Um, but a lot of people, when I told them that I had moved to this place, people who who lived elsewhere in Sweden, my, my friends and colleagues around the, the country, they started talking to me about vaccines. And I was like... I don't know anything about that. <laughs> they're like, yeah, they're they're crazy in your neck of the woods. You know, they don't they don't vaccinate their children, and they're they're stupid. They're idiots. Like they, they, there was a lot of anger, and 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 I didn't know anything about the topic. So I, but I just really got curious after, you know, ten people had told me that there are people in my uh, town that were crazy or stupid. So I just wanted basically to know what like what reasons. Could they have, if there are people who don't vaccinate their children, what reasons could they have? Um, I basically wanted to educate myself so that I could have a better response when my friends would tell me that, you know, my the, the, my people over here are are crazy. Um, so I decided I just wanted to find out, and so I uh, and so I found a, a a doctor very kindly. After a few months, he was a little bit unsure of my <laughs> intentions in the beginning but he very kindly uh, offered to speak on the topic and he's very knowledgeable and so yeah uh, i i asked him about it and he told me what his point of view was and so the point of view that i'm taking is that his <laughs> point of view is worth to be heard it's worth listening to it's not nonsense it's not stupidity it's not ignorance it's something that is worth taking in and and i think the other side of the conversation were you know where people talk about um, uh, measles, for example, that you know it's spreading and and it's a potentially deadly disease, and it's uh, all of this. I think that needs to be taken. I don't think either side is right or wrong. I think it, both sides have interesting points, and if it would be possible to to have a conversation about it, that would be more fruitful than having a shouting fest where you know both sides are screaming at the other side. Mm, exactly. We're all in this together. All in Is there anything else that you would like to talk about that I have not thought of to ask? I'll I'll tell you a little bit about uh, an upcoming project. Yeah. Even though, oh, it's double because telling about it is kind of taking the air out of the balloon a little bit for me. But I'm so jazzed about this that I, maybe I don't care. For, okay. for for like I'll just. I'll just squeeze a little bit of air out of it. There's we've we've mentioned a lot of inspirators, uh, Charles Eisenstein and um, Daniel Quinn and and some other people that have come up. There's another person who's incredible. Like he's such an amazing storyteller and poet and author and man. I just my my film platform is called Campfire Stories. If I could invite one only one person to my campfire to tell me stories, it would be this person. He is, oh my God, um, his name is Stephen Jenkinson. Um, he is a, uh, used to be a palliative care worker in Canada. And so he has a lot of experience with death and dying people. And he's written a book called Die Wise. And he's written another book called Something with Elders. Anyway. I'm so jazzed because I'm he's going on tour and he's going to to the United Kingdom and I have similar to with uh, Charles when I wrote on the contact form I did the same with with Stephen and have been granted man I hope I'm not jinxing it now mm. 
but I've been granted an, an interview with him. So I'm going to meet him in Portsmouth in the United States. Uh, no, the United Kingdom. Um, for Actually, I think it's going to be initially a, a pod. So the, the first ever Campfire Stories pod episode featuring Stephen Jenkinson should be coming up this summer. And then hopefully I will be able to use the audio for... Because I want to at some point make a film about death. Um, but I don't know how yet. So that's the thing. I can't make my brain come up with how I'm going to do it. It has to come to me in some other organic way. But I have a deep feeling that this... If I didn't jinx it and if it will happen that I meet Stephen Jenkins and, and get to speak with him and record his voice. Uh, I have a, a strong feeling that parts of that will be part of an upcoming film on death. Oh, that's great. I can't wait for that. And I, I think Charles is also a fan of Stephen Jenkinson. Yeah, it's, it's the same club. <laughs> he, he, uh, yeah, what is this club that we have here? Yeah, it's the uh, it Love the Earth and Embrace Death Club. It's the, it's the hippie club. <laughs> it is, it is, it really is. Well, I look forward to seeing that for sure. And, um, you know, again, I invite people to visit campfire-stories.org and make a donation and support your work. It's just beautiful work. And I think there are films that really get under your skin and into your heart. And I know they have mine and I, I think I've watched uh, probably over half your films and I'm, I'm feeding myself a, a daily diet and I just think they're gorgeous and love the work that you're doing. And I probably should have asked you this at the beginning, but where did you get the term campfire stories? It's a, a metaphoric idea of leaving, you know, like Charles Eisenstein talks about the, the old story and the new story. Um, the old story being one of uh, separation and the new story being one of interbeing. And so I, I just imagine myself having left the old story behind and, you know, just getting my hiking boots on and, and, and just walking, not really knowing exactly what my goal is or where I'm going or if I'm heading in the wrong direction. But at some point stopping and looking back to what I left behind and just seeing the smog hanging over the, the, the old story that I left behind and realizing that at least that's not the right direction. So wherever I'm going, even doesn't matter how lost I am, it, it's still the right direction. Um, and on this trek, somehow I'll probably meet other people like I've met you today. And at some point we might be tired and, and pitch the tent for the night and make a, a bonfire and, or a campfire. And, and sit down and, and have a chat. And uh, I might ask you what, what made you leave the old world behind and you might ask me. And, and that's the, the, the metaphoric ground from which the name springs. And, and I think a good representation of, of what I'm, visual representation of what I'm trying to do. Mm. Beautiful. Well, we've been around the campfire right now and you know I'm replacing the fire with the digital blue screen light of my laptop screen <laughs> but um, in a way it's a, sort of a great blending of modern technology and ancient storytelling and really appreciate what you're doing Matthias and your films and everything else I know you're expressing something that needs to be expressed and uh, really appreciate what you're doing and that you're both making it happen and getting out of the way enough so that it can happen. And you're a beautiful man, beautiful human being, and I uh, really appreciate what you're doing. And whether we get together in physical world or not, you know, I know we'll be in touch and uh, I'll be following your journey. And thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I, it's, it's been a, a great chat and yeah, really cool to sit around the campfire with you. Thank you so much. We're all in this together. All in this together. All in this. All in this together. All in this. Yeah, we're all in this together. Ooh. Rhythm of life. 
rhythm of 